Welcome to English Country Life. Here on the Small Holding Homestead, we try and be self-sufficient as possible growing our own food. And to make it grow, we need to water it. And we use a hose and we use watering cans. But where does that water come from? Because we're in a metered water area. So to save money and be as green as possible, we harvest a lot of our own water. So let us show you what we do. Hello, welcome to the newly planted garlic bed. My name's Hugh and together with my lovely wife Fiona, we run a small holding homestead here in South Lincolnshire in the UK. And Lincolnshire is a very dry county. At certain times of year, we go many weeks without rain. And in order to grow the crops that we need to survive, we have to water them. But the mains water we get here is transported from a very long way away and it's refined to be good quality drinking water and it's wasteful ecologically and economically to use that to irrigate our crops. So we produce as much of the water as we can that we need from rainwater harvesting. Well we've been doing that for over 10 years now and a lot of people have asked us what lessons we've learned and how we set that system up and today we're going to share all those secrets with you. The very first thing we did was work out how much water we use. Now, you might think this is quite daunting and it's actually not that difficult because there's two methods of watering, as we said before, there's the watering can and there's a house pipe. Well, this watering can will hold 10 litres of water. So if I use it three times a day, that's 30 litres and a standard water butt will hold 300 litres. So that will give us 10 days coverage. But I'm sat next to this, which is butternut squash. And we grow quite a lot of butternut squash and pumpkin and these need a lot of water. They're very, very water hungry. So three watering cans on one session is not going to cut it. And then if we look across the entire vegetable area, we need a lot more. So if we use the hose pipe, how much does that use? Well, it might surprise you to learn that actually a standard hose pipe will get through a thousand litres in one hour. So if we use the hose pipe for half an hour per day across the entire vegetable area, which actually isn't that much, that's going to be 500 litres. So a standard water butt holding 300 litres just isn't going to give us even one day's coverage. So let's have a look at once we've done those calculations, just by observing what we do on a daily basis, how we then related it to our storage. So we worked out we were using the hose pipe roughly for about 30 minutes a day and we're watering the greenhouse using watering cans. So we had to work out how much water we needed and in summer we have around 40 days where we're likely to have a dry spell. So that means we're going to need around 20,000 litres of storage. Now what have we got? Well the first thing is we had a couple of inbuilt things which a lot of modern properties wouldn't have. And the first one is a system which was built when the cottage was built and it takes the rainwater from the gutters and moves it into a huge underground water storage system. Now you can actually buy these from more modern properties. They're massive tanks, you bury it in the ground and the water comes from the gutters down a pipe into that system great way of storing water. We've also got a well which a lot of modern properties won't have but that still wasn't giving us enough comfort that we'd have enough water during 40 days of dry spell. So what do we do instead? Well this are a couple of options and for watering cans if you are using a watering can these are the perfect solution and they're just basic water butts. Now this one is not actually ours it's very small it's only 200 litres but this is actually my parents and we're storing it for them because they're buying a house down the road which I'm really happy about but that's another story we're digressing so this is one of ours and it's not connected at the moment because it started to leak so I'm actually going to use this instead to store chicken poo to rot it down but again I'm digressing we've replaced it with a brand new one on the greenhouse which doesn't leak and we use this to fill our watering cans to water the plants which are in the greenhouse we don't use the hoses in there 
You might notice that it's actually on a stand and the very simple reason that it's on a stand is because we need to fit a watering can actually underneath the tap. So if you are getting a water butt, that's why a stand is really recommended. But that isn't enough for us because we use a hose pipe in the main for the crops down the field. And this is our storage solution. These are IBC tanks. Each one holds a thousand litres and we've got quite a lot of these at various places around the property. And they're connected to the roofs on the barns and Hugh will show you in a little while about how that works. You also notice that they're painted black and he's going to tell you exactly why that is because there's a great reason behind that. It has to be said that unlike the water butts which basically just use gravity to fill the watering can, if you're going to use an IBC tank with a hose pipe attached, because it's on a hose pipe, the water pressure to get it down the field isn't enough so we do use a pump. And again, we are going to talk a lot more in detail about the pump, how that works, what we selected. So let's move on and have a look at the rainwater harvesting that we've actually got. Fiona has explained how we calculate what we go through, our consumption of water. I just want to spend a minute or two explaining to you how we can work out how much water we can produce from rainfall. Now the roof behind us, we put on. That barn was burned out when we moved in and we've converted it into a useful workshop space. And I can tell you that the flat roof that you're looking at back there, the Wrigley tin roof, is 50 square metres, the part that's facing us. Now, with a little bit of very simple maths, we can work out that for every centimetre of rain that falls on a 50 square metre roof, we will get 500 litres of water. Well, that's great. So how much will that give us? Well, a little bit of online research shows that our rainfall on average in August is about six centimetres of rain here. Well, that's going to give us 3000 litres that will run down into these IBC tanks. The difficulty that gives us is our consumption is 500 litres a day. So that'll only give us six days of our needs for August. So we have to gather more water elsewhere. And we have IBC tanks scattered around the property, gathering water from all the other roofs, including the one to my right, which also feeds the array of IBC tanks behind me. Now, what's interesting is if you look at that roof of an older property, that's pantile. And pantile is a great environment for things like moss to grow because some of the water just soaks into the tiles. And that in turn brings all sorts of rubbish of bits of dead moss and what have you down into the gutters. That blocks the gutters and if we're not careful it will also wash down into the water tanks and that causes problems of algal growth etc. So we have to regularly clean the gutters and fit guards to the downspouts to avoid that happening. Let me show you how we do that. Take a look at a tile in the top right hand corner of the screen. You can see a load of brown dead moss on it. What happens is in the cool wet times these terracotta tiles absorb moisture. They make a great environment for moss to grow on, and it does. Then we get a dry spell. All the moisture evaporates from the tile, the moss dies, and it rolls down the roof, or is washed down the roof if we get a rainstorm, into the gutters. And it will block the gutter completely if we leave it in there. It makes a real mess. So what we have to do is not only just clean the gutters, but if you look along the gutter to the far end, you can just about see a roll of fine metal mesh. All I do is take some fine mesh, stainless, cut a piece off, roll it up tight, push it into the downspout and let it uncoil so it sticks there. And then anything washing along the gutters can't go down the downspout, but we still have to leave space to clear the gutters out regularly. As regular viewers will know, recently Fiona has been doing maintenance work on these barns and in the yard and painting the walls and repairing the bitumen. So to do that, we had to empty these tanks and pull them away from the wall. It's a great time to do some maintenance. And really that's not different than preparing a new tank. So what do we do? Well, the first thing to do is to tilt the tanks up, shove a log or a brick under them and make sure they're fully drained. Because even if they're only one tenth full of water, that's a hundred kilos of water. So get them empty. 
Next thing, there's two bars across the top of a tank. Some of them are Allen key, some of them are screw, doesn't make much difference, but undo those two bars. They can be quite stiff because they're often rusted in place, but you can always get them off with a little bit of elbow grease, remove the grub screws, take them off like that, and then they'll pull through. They normally sit through one of the handles on the top of the liner. And we're going to take those bars off so that we can take the liner out completely and paint it. To do that, you can do it on your own. It's really not heavy once it's fully empty and you've got the bars off. All I do, lay the tank down on its side and just pull the liner out using the attached handles. Then I've got to clean it. Now, whether it's new or whether it's one that you've had a long time like these, to get paint on, they need to be clean. I scrub them down with detergent and then I'll take the jet wash to them and I'll wash all that detergent off and make sure that we really have got a clean surface to paint on. I'll also take the opportunity to clean out the inside of the tank. If it's a new one, it's often had things like cooking oil in it. If it's an old one, it'll have debris from the gutters. So give it a really good clean. Once that's happened, let it dry. And then before you paint it, on one of the corners at the front, put a strip of wide masking tape right from the bottom to the top. I do this so that I get a water level gauge after I've finished painting. Because otherwise you can't tell how much water you've got in each of your individual tanks. And every now and again, we will get more water than we need and we'll need to drain the tanks down. But all it is, a little bit of masking tape so that we don't paint over that area. This is the paint that we use. We use bitumen paint. It's black, it's like treacle, but oh my goodness, it lasts a really long time. It protects the liner against UV light and breakdown, and it prevents algal growth on the inside because it excludes all the daylight and algae needs daylight. And as you can see, I put it on just using one of those little gloss rollers with a sponge roller piece on it. And I don't even use the tray because it's mucky stuff. I use an old ice cream tub or something similar to hold some of the paint in, but it gives brilliant coverage. Then I let it dry overnight. Once it's completely dry, I'll take that bit of masking tape and peel it away. And hey presto, there's the rain gauge. And then just reassemble the tanks. With the tanks reassembled, for your first tank, obviously you need to cut a hole in the top to let the guttering in. Usually, of course, you're going to have to divert the guttering, but I just find a short piece of spare guttering with two of these 45 degree angles is quite sufficient to run the water into the tank. Now, here's a top tip. For any tank that isn't the first tank, drill a hole in the cap. Because we're going to be using a pump, if you pump water out of this tank without any way of air getting in, you will completely collapse the liner. Ask me how I know. The last part of the puzzle when it comes to an IBC tank is the tap. Look at this. It's a two inch threaded nozzle and the water fairly chucks it out. So you've got to adapt it just a little bit to be suitable for water in the garden. We used to get these, these are blanking plates because the two inch tap is threaded and all we would do is drill a hole in it suitable for a standard tap hose fixing and that way we could adapt it to fit a hose. Really wasn't very difficult. All you do is put the threaded part through the hole from the inside like that and then you get hold of a standard outdoor tap fixing, screw it up the other side nice and tight and away you go. That's what we used to do. Nowadays, it can be even easier. Those worked and they were fine, but they could leak a little bit. Now you can get fully molded two inch covers with a hose connector on the end of them. So there's no possibility of them leaking at all. You can even get these. These have got a half inch internal thread that you can attach a hose fitting to, as I am there, or you can even do things like this. This is two outlet outdoor tap. So you can get your water running in one of the outlets and use the other one to attach your pump. Whichever fitting you go with, it just screws neatly onto the two inch outlet by the tap at the bottom of your IB sink tank. There really isn't much to it at all. And when you've put it on there, all you can do is just connect a hose in the normal way. It really is very simple. But what if you've got more than one tank? Well, you can just get a piece of hose. If you've got two tanks, a little bit longer than this, with a push connector on each end and join the two tanks together with one piece of hose. But there's a better way for multiple tanks. 
and that's this. This is a Y connector for hose lock systems. And if you get a short lead like this, push the Y connector into it, it gives you two outlets. Then if you connect that to your tank, you can put a feed from your main tank on one side. And once you've done that, the water's flowing into this second tank. But you can also put an outlet feed on the other side. And that outlet feed could go to your pump. So both tanks feed the pump or the outlet feed could go to a third tank. And then you could do that the same way to a fourth, fifth tank, do as many as you want. Finally, if you want to get really fancy, there are switching systems. So what you do is you put your feed into there from your main tank, and then you've got multiple turn on and off outlets that connect to a second, third, fourth, and fifth tank. And you literally switch them on, switch them off. We do use one of those on our five tank array. And the reason is that I can isolate tanks individually if I want to clean them or maintain them in any way at all. But they're not totally necessary. We've done all of our calculations, we've worked out where we're taking the water from, we've got our IBC tanks in place. So, what's the problem now? Well, let me demonstrate something to you, and this is why I've got the plant pot here. I've connected this little bit of hose pipe with a nozzle to the IBC tank. And if I press my little trigger, you can see I have got some flow from the nozzle, but as I raise it, dries up completely. And if I'm walking around with this hose pipe and nozzle, I'm not going to be able to water any of the plants whatsoever. And as the level in the IBC tank goes down, it gets worse because I'm, hosing no I'm holding that nozzle above the level of the water. If I'm down the field as well, that gravity really is not enough to get any water flow down the field such a distance away. So what's our solution? This is our solution. This is our water pump. Now, yes, it does use a bit of electricity, but we can do that through solar panels. But that's the subject of another video. So how does it work? Well, this pipe here goes to the IBC tank. So that takes that low gravity, low pressure pump water into the pump itself. It then generates lots of pressure and pops it out through this pipe to the nozzle. So let me just show you that difference. And I'm going to turn it on so there is a little bit of noise. Now low down, I think you can see already, there's a huge amount of difference in the pressure. But if I raise that nozzle, that pressure doesn't change. So this is the only real way that we can take that gravity-fed IBC um, water down to the field. If we were relying on that, there'd be no flow rate down there whatsoever. So this water pump is completely invaluable and one of the best things we ever bought for ourselves here on the small holding homestead. That's an overview of our rainwater harvesting system. And what we've tried to show is it's geared to our needs, our crops, our climate, our environment. If you want one for yourself, obviously you've got to tailor it to your needs. We could have shown you so much more. We could have shown extracting water from the system, dropping an input line down the well. We could have shown different types of pumps, different configurations of tanks, and so on and so on. But we wanted to give an overview. If you'd like more detail, please tell us what you want to know about down in the comments, and we'll try and either answer the co comment or produce a video to give you the extra detail you're interested in. It doesn't even have to be about water harvesting. If you want to know about solar setups, for example, ask us that as well. If you've enjoyed today's video, can you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below. And if you'd like to see more from us on self-sufficient, self-reliant living, click on the subscribe button and the bell next to it. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, it's completely free and you'll hear every time we upload a new video. But for today, thanks for watching. Come back and see us soon. Take care.